An October dawn. A young girl is standing outside her mother's bedroom door and listening. She's been told over and again not to disturb her mother, but she checks on her every morning all the same, listens out to catch the sound of a regular breath. But this morning she has to strain to hear anything, and all that meets her is silence. She pushes open the door and ventures inside, and in the meagre light she makes out her mother's profile on the pillow. Stone still. The little girl screams and the house erupts. Servants come running and the child is snatched up and held close by a maid. But the girl keeps screaming, telling them that she wants to wake her mother up. Why are they holding her back from the person she loves beyond all others? Don't they know that without her mother she's lost? Without her mother she might as well be alone in the whole world. Because no one else will ever understand her. No one else will ever love her in the same way. You're listening to The Kiss, the story of the women who made a movie masterpiece. Episode 2, A Motherless Girl. Menschen's Kind, warum glaubst du bloß, gerade dein Katharina Winslow was only 41 years old when she died at home in the German city of Darmstadt in 1901. Six years earlier, she'd held on to her eldest child, Arthur, as he took his last breath. He'd only been 15 years old, her beloved firstborn. Gentle, devoted, religiously devout, Frau Winslow now approached her own death with the resignation of a parent who's known profound grief already and has little left to fear or imagine. What would become of her other two, her remaining son and daughter, Ralph and Christa? Well, they had each other, of course, and their father. Many times in the recent months, she'd tried to prepare the children for the approaching challenge of being motherless. Ralph was bound to thrive eventually. He was already showing an interest in the family business, in other words, becoming a serving cavalry officer. And Katerina's husband, Lieutenant Colonel Arthur Winslow, well, despite being a Scotsman, he'd always been married to the Prussian cavalry first. But what about Christa? She was only ten years old, and so wholly attached to her mother that there was inevitable pain ahead for her. She was very sensitive and needy, the baby of the family, a soft, sweet, playful, highly affectionate girl who craved love and attention. Krista needed to be given her freedom if she were ever to flourish. How would such a wayward, emotional, susceptible girl ever fit into this proud Prussian family anyway? Losing such a sweet-natured, compassionate and devoted mother was nothing short of a personal catastrophe for Krista Winslow. One thing was for sure. The last thing that such a free-spirited child should ever be subjected to was any kind of institutionalised life. Even before her mother died, even before she was sent off to a school in an effort to be institutionalised, Krista Winslow had a very strong sense of her differentness. We know this now from her letters, but mostly from her fictional writings, which were, to be honest, barely fictional. In fact, that death scene with her mother comes from her novel, The Child Manuela, which, when you hold it against what we know of her life, is more or less an autobiography. Krista returns to this notion of the pain of differentness on and off for the rest of her life. She didn't fit in. It was as simple as that. The great tragedy of her childhood, the loss of her mother, served to further isolate her from her immediate world, because without her mother she very much doubted that she could cope with this burden of not belonging. At such a young age she already understood what she needed, and what she needed was unquestioning support and loving supervision. She had her mother's gentleness and instinct for love. Who else, then, would get her other than her beloved mother? So why should Krista feel so different and isolated? How can you tell, at such a young age, why you feel disconnected or out of place? She was uncomfortable with who she was, for a start. She felt overdressed and restricted in her skirts and cumbersome dresses, 
Remember, at the turn of the last century, women were pretty much trussed up when it came to clothing. Krista longed to run about in a pair of trousers. Such an odd obsession to want to wear trousers, but it dogged Krista into adulthood, was a very real longing, and became for her a goal tied up with freedom and release. Then there was this breathless awe for older women, a kind of craving to be held and mothered by them, to be looked after and adored. But it was something else, too. They were beautiful and desirable, and as a young girl, she couldn't understand why she was so fascinated by them, but could imagine planting a kiss on a bare female shoulder or bosom. Was she seeking a warm and loving replacement for a lost parent? Or was it something else, something more fundamental even than that? How was a child supposed to know? All she could divine from her situation was that she was alone and that there was a risk that she'd never be understood. So, we know that the adolescent Krista felt uncomfortable growing towards an ideal of womanhood, but there was another way in which she felt totally wrong, and that was her immediate society. Krista Winslow had no fewer than six uncles, five of whom, along with her father, served in either the Prussian or Baden cavalry. In fact, her uncle Herbert is cited as being the first German officer to fall in the Franco-Prussian War in 1870. Her world was one of dominant, uniformed men, sabres, horses, parades, pride, exclusivity. While Christa was very young, her father was put in charge briefly of the garrison at Strasbourg, a city of immense significance when it came to French and German relations. The French had surrendered it after a siege, and its residents deeply resented their Prussian occupiers. For the young Christa, the city's narrow streets and high walls always felt stifling and confining. Her early memories of the place were dominated by all things military. Even when the Winslows returned to Darmstadt, beautiful, artistic, historic Darmstadt, military influence was never far away. It might have been alien to her, but she had a sick feeling that she was still expected to have some kind of role in it all, at the very least to continue the Winslow line of soldiers. Let's stop a moment and get our heads around what we mean by Prussianism because it's such a strong theme in Christa's film, Mädchen in Uniform, albeit from a fascinating female vantage point. By the time Christa was born, Germany had been a united nation for some 18 years, but it was still dominated politically and culturally by Prussia, its biggest and most successful state. Prussia was not so much a geographical area by then as a state of mind, and an extremely assertive and chauvinistic one at that. From its origins in the 13th century, it grew to be the pre-eminent martial power in the 18th, under its powerful and highly influential leader, Frederick the Great. Though Prussian influence waned slowly over the next century, it was still the undisputed leader of the pack, and Christa's family enjoyed the elitism and sense of importance that went with membership of the so-called Juncker class, the nobility. I've mentioned that the Winslows were originally from Scotland, and it might seem hard to believe that six Scottish boys could have so effectively penetrated this closed brotherhood of Prussian elite. But in fact, I've discovered that for centuries, Scotsmen had been starting new lives in Prussia, either as itinerant merchants, clergymen or soldiers. Scotland was referred to as the great recruiting depot of Europe. Some historians felt sure that much of the reputation for Prussia's grit and endurance could be laid at the door of its Scottish immigrants. Here's one of those 19th century historians and what he had to say about the Prussian-Scottish phenomenon. Casting back a look over the vast numbers of Scotsmen in Prussia in the 17th century and noting their gradual assimilation and absorption, we do not wonder at the statement of the anonymous English merchant and residents of Danzig of the 18th century that one third of the city was of Scottish blood, nor at the other statement of the German scholar of the 19th who attributes the stubbornness and the shrewdness of the Eastern Prussian to the influx of the Scots. The Winslows took to Prussian military life like it was imprinted on their DNA. Arthur Winslow's marriage to a Protestant German girl from a noble country family pretty much completed the picture. The couple gave their sons solidly Anglo-Saxon names, 
and their pretty dark-eyed daughter was christened Christiane Kate, our Christa. We shouldn't underestimate how dominant this sense of tradition was, particularly in a German of growing military importance in a wider Europe. But there was another Germany, one of art and culture, and it's funny to think that in Darmstadt these two worlds should come to collide. This southern German city was a cool place for a young girl with artistic leanings to be growing up. Germany at that point was on the edge of the greatest cultural flowering of modern European history, with Darmstadt a kind of shrine to new and experimental art. The city was a curious mix of the aristocratic, the bourgeois and the avant-garde. In fact, it had been the eccentric, gay Grand Duke of Hesse, Ernst Ludwig, who had encouraged artistic enterprise in the city, creating the Empire Centre for Jugendstil, that's Germany's take on Art Nouveau. Architects were given a free hand to bring modernity to the old town, and the results were dramatic, breathtaking and joyously bizarre. Everywhere Christa looked, strange and exciting buildings were sprouting up, giving the town a kind of crazy fairy tale silhouette. In fact, there's a little bit of Christa captured in the city's artistic history. In her late teens, she sat for the famous sculptor and Darmstadt's artist in residence, Heinrich Jobst. His rather ethereal and serene marble bust of the young Christa is still on view in one of the city's oldest museums. It must have been heaping pain upon pain for this free-spirited girl to be looking out at such an exciting world, only to know that her family had other intentions for her. The mantra of Christa's class was, know your place. The world operated as a series of spheres, and you remain inside yours for fear of contamination from others. You bowed and you scraped when you were in the company of the highest of your peers, the princes and princesses, the archdukes and duchesses, who were myriad in recently unified Germany. You came across the working class because they laboured for you, and the bourgeoisie hopefully never. But it was outside her own sphere that people seemed really to live, to express themselves, to make beautiful things, write wonderful accounts of their passionate, messy world. She looked across at the sphere of the writers, artists, sculptors, poets, actors, and that's what she longed for their apparent freedom to speak out and live honestly and spontaneously. That was where she really belonged, with the artists. But how on earth would she get there? Do you remember in the last episode when we went through the plot of Machen in Uniform, we met the imperious headmistress of the girls' school. She personified old Prussia in her tight corset and the medal on her bosom, with her swagger and her walking stick. Her words rang through the film, through discipline and through hunger we shall be great again. Greatness would come from suffering. I remember reading a very vivid account years ago of the school attended by the young Charlotte Bronte. This time it was for daughters of the clergy, not the military, but the principle was hauntingly similar. Hunger and deprivation were the making of you. And in the case of Charlotte's school, Cowan Bridge, dying on school premises was not unusual and often the direct result of mistreatment and lack of care. Both Charlotte Bronte and Krista Winslow chose to depict the harshness of their education in fiction. In fact, Charlotte toned down her version because she felt people might accuse her of making it up. The way girls' schools have been depicted in fiction fascinates me, possibly due to some uncomfortable memories of my own. And in a later episode, we can enjoy some other examples of this subgenre, as well as learning how Christa was accused of plagiarism by a British writer with her own account. But let's get back to Germany now and this ethos of necessary suffering. We're nearing the moment when Christa leaves home for boarding school. We can only wonder at how she was feeling about it. We know, again from piecing together her autobiographical fiction, that she was more or less left to her own devices after her mother died. Krista was bringing herself up, and it was coming to the attention of her wider family. There was no question that her father should be a hands-on parent. No, it was for a school to mould her, and not any old school. One that subscribed to Prussian values, one that perfectly bought into that suffering thing. Years later, her play Gestern und Heute, or Yesterday and Today, 
would address these issues of an ideological education. It was also the first outing of the infamous school later portrayed in the film. In the play, one of the schoolgirls, Edelgard, utters the words that form the central antagonism of the film. It is a duty to subdue our feelings. A Prussian woman must know discipline. She must first learn to obey, so that later she can command. Obey and command, such military language for a girls' school. All the girls of Christa's class knew what was expected of them. The success of the nation depended on them. But Christa knew this course was a disastrous route for her, in so many ways. The system was pulling her down, and with her beloved mother gone, there was no one left to fight her corner. At 14 years old, having spent the last few motherless years running wild and neglected by her father, Christa's aunts and uncles decided that now was the time to send her off to boarding school. Next time on The Kiss, we'll enter the world of the Empress Augusta School and Orphanage and learn about Christa's struggle to break away from the suffocating life that was expected of her and of the mysterious young woman who helped ease her suffering and homesickness. The Kiss, the story of the women who made a movie masterpiece. Researched, written and presented by Bibi Berkey. Studio production was by Francis Nutby Mother. It was directed by Mark Lingwood and the original music was composed by Timothy Bond. It was brought to you by Tempest Productions.